Well, good afternoon. It is Sunday, August 13th. I'm Delaware State Representative Paul Bomback, uh, here to provide a weekly update uh, for the Delaware State Retired Employee Health Benefits. This is an issue that uh, sort of sparked a firestorm last summer when the uh, administration, uh, the Governor Carney administration, proposed a uh, fairly substantial change of uh, how those benefits would be provided to retirees from a traditional Medigap style program to a uh, much newer format Medicare Advantage program. Uh, there was a group formed and they took the state to court and uh, a justice, a judge, uh, ruled that the state had to stop its efforts to uh, make that wholesale change and uh, to stay uh, for the time being until an order uh, got changed uh, to stay on the current system, which is a Medicare Advantage, I'm sorry, Medicare, Medigap program, Medicare supplement kind of program. Um, the legislature in early January passed Senate Bill 29, the governor signed it. This added some members to the committee that ultimately makes those decisions, the State Employee Benefit Committee, and also established a subcommittee, the Retirement Health Care Benefits Advisory Subcommittee. I serve on that committee as a co-vice chair along with Senator Townsend and the subcommittee is chaired by Lieutenant Governor Bethany Hall Long. Uh, we have had a lot of uh, committee meetings. And so if we look here, uh, here's a website on all the subcommittees for the State Employee Benefit Committee. And you can see the third one down is the RHBAS. Um, and you can see meeting after meeting starting in March through April, through May, through June, through July, through August. Um, uh, and we've had somewhere around 14 meetings and we're still not done. Um, so what is uh, immediately ahead of, uh, ahead of us is the State Employee Benefit Committee is expected to issue a request for proposal. That's where they have created a, uh, a, a packet that let's insure health insurance companies know that the state would like them to share some bids for providing health care for Delaware's state retired state employees. And that package includes a description of what kind of insurance uh, we'd like to have in there. Uh, and it, through its through its silence, it can indicate which uh, kinds of health insurance we don't want to have in there. So uh, that is expected to be uh, sent out around October 1st to be finalized uh, by perhaps the second half of September. So our subcommittee has essentially four weeks in which to provide any input which would have a chance of being considered by the committee that makes these decisions. Um, so we're coming down to the wire. Uh, we, I'd say at most are gonna have two meetings uh, before the SCBC makes their decisions. And therefore, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's <laughs> it's time. It's time to start. Uh, it's time to really get uh, finished on this work. There is more work beyond it, um, but and we'll talk about that. So um, this is a, a site I always search on Delaware SCBC subcommittee materials, and then I click on it, and then it lets me know, lets me choose amongst the three subcommittees. I always choose the last one. Pull this up, and then I go for the latest uh, various documents. So this is the agenda from this past Thursday's meeting. Uh, nothing really notable. I do want to mention that most of these meetings have been at the State Benefit Office uh, at Commerce Way in Dover starting uh, next meeting, which is on the 24th. It will be held at the State Insurance Commissioner's um, offices, uh, which is on like Silver Lake Boulevard or something like that in that uh, uh, corporate center. So uh, don't go to the old place if you're planning to come to the October 24th meeting. Uh, it'll be listed this location on the agenda that comes out for the twenty for the meeting on the twenty fourth, which should be out this Thursday, the seventeenth. Okay, so the, the meeting is the normal one. We review the minutes, and then we've got some new material to go through, and then a dis, uh, discussion, and then public comment, and we adjourn. Um, I made a motion that the public comment be presented to the subcommittee before we decided and voted on things, um, and that was adopted. So we did get to hear from a lot of retirees. A lot of members of the public uh, who shared their views on the work of the subcommittee uh, and often shared their views on Medicare Advantage. Uh, uh, a spoiler alert, uh, uh, the 
members of the public who spoke up are not fans of Medicare Advantage. Um, so that was the agenda for Thursday's meeting. Um, these are the slides that were presented. Uh, a lot of it was a review uh, of past material, a little bit of new stuff. Um, I had asked that they try to put on one slide sort of everything. Um, I, I like to distill things down in a digestible um, format. Um, we've said there's three different ways to uh, save money. The state currently has these big promises of health care it'll deliver, it'll provide to state employees, retired employees, both current retirees and future retirees, both in the current year and in future years. We've made these promises. We haven't set aside money for that. Um, so there's a big gap, a big funding gap, and we're trying to narrow that gap. We're trying to actually, we want to raise the funding so that as a proportion of the prom the cost of the promises, we're somewhere north of 70, maybe north of 80%. Actually, at the last meeting, we voted and said, we'd like to have a, a, a goal, a stated goal of, of uh, uh, filling that by 80%. So that's what these percentages uh, apply to. So if we look at funding, uh, the first part of the state funding of payroll, we currently put 0.36% in. And that baseline says of that gap, we've already filled up about 18% of it. So we're, you know, we're not, we're not at the bottom. We're up, you know, 18%, 17.8%. Um, in addition, if we were to boost that up to 1% from 0.36%, and that's not a big difference. Uh, I think it's like 25 million a year. Sounds like a whole lot. It's a lot of dollars, but in the grand scheme of how much the state pays for um, payroll, it's, you know, it's just two thirds of 1%. Um, that would add another 7.7, .7, get us up to 25%. So we're, you know, about a third of the way. Um, if we did that, if we went further and increased uh, that amount, percent of payroll uh, by half, uh, is this going up uh, gradually over 10 years, by 1% increments, um, we go beyond where we need to go. We would more than fully fund it. We overfund it. Um, so that's one of the things we had them run some analysis on. Um, the next one is a baseline plus 1% carve out. So the baseline is at 0.36% that we already have. And without increasing that to 1%, let's take 1% of the budget. Budget's currently about $5 billion a year in, for Delaware. 1% is about $50 million per year. Um, and it would go up with inflation, with the rising uh, cost of running the state government. So, and, and they assume it goes up by about 3.6%, I think is the current assumption. So by doing that, we bring everything up to about 60%, 59.8%. So just the current level of payroll um, money going into this fund, and then this 1% of the budget gets us to 60%. We want to get to 80, but that's a good, good um, progress, good level of progress there. Um, and that's something which uh, Governor Carney and his recommended budget uh, for this past fiscal year, ending this past June 30th, and recommended for the current fiscal years that started July 1st. The General Assembly approved both of those. So for the past two years, we've been doing that, not because we're required to do that, but because we felt it's the right move to make. Um, you know what? You can't read that. So I'm going to shift the angles around a little bit. Um, by the way, I put my email in there and also feel free to ask any questions. So here, um, here's the percentages. Uh, and this was in those, uh, in that PowerPoint, uh, that was in the mini materials from Thursday's meeting. Um, so that we're up to 60%, just that alone adds 42% to that funding level, filling the gap. Um, and if we did more 2% or 3%, we could get, um, up to 75% and then above 80%. Um, if we just did that, plus the existing payroll, 0.36%. Well, how if we work on eligibility? And that's um, reducing who is eligible or uh, delaying uh, the point at which they become eligible um, or uh, sometimes uh, increasing their costs for covering a spouse, um, things like that. So you can see there's four that we've looked at. Um, charging retirees 50% of the cost uh, if they want a spouse covered. Um, having it so that uh, you currently need, and, and don't quote me on this, but you need 15 years of service to get 25 or 50% of your health care covered. Um, and then maybe it's you know 20 or 25 years in order to get 75% and 30 years to get 100%, somewhere along those lines, but it's a, it's a ladder. And the second bullet of the increased graduated state share based on years of service would just lengthen it. So instead of it being 15 years when you get a certain amount, you have to wait until 20 years to get a certain amount 
of coverage of your health benefits. Um, so that's another one. Third one is eliminate future vested uh, retirees from eligibility. This is, uh, say you have somebody who works 25 years, and let's say they start at 21, uh, maybe 22. Uh, they got their uh, degree in teaching, and they've taught uh, our public school students for 25 years and retire. How old are they? Uh, they're about 47. Um, they're not eligible uh, for a pension at that point because of their youth. Um, and what this would do is say, well, if you're not eligible for a pension, you also aren't eligible yet uh, for retiree health benefits. And the idea is somebody who uh, stops state service at the age of 47 uh, is not somebody who likely is fully retired. And as an employer, um, you know, a lot of a lot of employers say, I want to provide your health benefits when you turn 65. Um, but if you retire at you know, 50, um, you're on your own for a while. And, and once you turn 65, then it'll, it'll start up. That's what this increase uh, minimum wage, I'm sorry, that is increased minimum required age. But the future vested, that is for someone who uh, works a, a lot of years and vests into their pension, but they don't, they're not eligible to receive the pension then because of their youth. Um, and this says, if, if that happens, we're not getting you um, health benefits. You have another, you know, maybe 18 years of your career of, of working uh, and uh, of employment, and it's your sort of last employer before retirement that should be responsible for your retiree health benefits. Um, so that's that third bullet. And the fourth one is increase in um, age, required age. And this is something where, you know, currently you can have somebody 25 years of service at, you know, age of 47 eligible uh, for health benefits if we don't do that third bullet. This says, no, you can't be eligible until at least, let's say, 60, maybe 62. And if you're a retired uh, law enforcement officer, our state police are required to retire at age 55. So if the state's requiring they retire at 55, it seems reasonable to make sure that they're eligible for their pension and health benefits at 55. So maybe we have a lower level for classes of employees who have a mandated uh, retirement age that's less than that planned uh, level of, say, 60 or so. And then the, the last category is a benefit design. And this is, this is really what that RFP, that request for proposal is, is what kind of health insurance, uh, what kind of health benefits, what kind of plan for that are you using? Um, so the first we one that we looked at was an HRA, a health reimbursement account. That's one where the employer, in this case, the state, gives you a hunk of money up front. Let's say it's $5,000 to cover you for the year. And then you spend it as you see fit. Maybe as part of that, the state has arranged um, several different kinds of uh, insurance programs, and you can use that some of that five thousand to pay the premiums for them. You can also use it for any co-payments, any deductibles, um, up until it runs out. At which point, you know, you're on your own. What we found is that um, it can save money uh, if it has a two percent annual inflation increase. So if it's five thousand the first year, fifty one hundred dollars the second year. But if we did it with a 4% annual increase, so 5,000 the first year, 5,200 the second year, and keep that going on. And keep in mind, someone retires, this is largely talking about Medicare age, age 65 and above. Um, 65, you can have 30 years ahead of you. So 30 years at 2%, it's a, it's a lot. Um, but 30 years at 40, at 4% annually is a, is a big increase. And what we found is that um, we can indeed I'll say save money, fill that gap. If we do that 2%, it's you know, almost well 9% or so difference. Um, but if we do it at 4%, it doesn't save any money. It actually often costs us a little money. When we also dug deeply into this, what we found is that an HRA, if you started in this format at age 65, at 4%, um, well, at 2%, what happens is you, the average person is going to um, use less than the full amount in those early years and will build up a balance in their HRA account. Um, and then they'll start tapping that in their, say, late 70s and early 80s. And the account would likely run to zero in the late 80s, maybe early 90s. And then, you know, it'll cover the first 5,000 or so um, of costs in your 90s, but uh, your costs will be higher than that. And you'll be out of pocket for that difference. That 2% doesn't keep up with the cost of healthcare inflation. The 4% does, but it doesn't save any money. So either we can save money and have our most senior retirees uh, really run out of money uh, for their health care, which most people don't want to see happen, or uh, we can provide for them fine, and it makes no difference on the gap in, in health care costs and the funding for it. So no progress or hurt our 
uh, oldest retirees, they seem like two uh, poor choices. So um, most of us have sort of ruled HRAs out. I don't think we've officially done that. Hopefully we will, maybe on the 24th. So uh, the next one is we looked at Medi uh, our current plan. It's a Medigap. It's a Medicare supplement plan. Um, it's that format. It's not a specifically one that you can get you know, just from your, your local broker, but it's very similar to that. And I know very similar is a catchphrase. Just trust me on that one. Um, it's similar to that. So let's keep it. Um, but then we're going to currently um, retirees either pay 0% or 5% of the um, measured calculated, one can say mythical, premium uh, for the Medicfill program. Um, this would say we're going to start charging either 10% or 15%. We measure two different things. Um, and now, um, and what you see is that it doesn't change much. It's, you know, if you, if you raise it from 5% to 10% share, it raises half percent, you know, 0.6, 0.7% um, funding. So it goes from 17.8 to 18.4. I mean, really a <clears throat> really minimal impact. And then if we bring it up to 15%, it's just less than one and a half percent, around one and a half percent. Um, and then uh, the, the fifth choice is MA, that's Medicare Advantage. That's the, that's the uh, format, the program, which uh, many of our retirees have expressed deep, deep um, uh, distrust of um, and very clear in their desire that that not be uh, made available to them, not, not given to them, especially replacing something like uh, Medicfill, a, a Medicare supplement plan. So if we just did that, uh, it would save 5%, maybe 7%. 0.7%. <coughs> and then look at here is that's not gigantic. That's not really moving the needle. Um, you know, a 7.7% from going 0.36 to 1%, you know, that does more than, you know, the same or more than this Medicare Advantage in any stretch. And we aren't hearing screams about doing the 0.36 to 1%. We're seeing a successful lawsuit when we tried to do do Medicare Advantage. So I mean, I look at this and say, that's not doing much. But anyway, we modeled it. And then the last two are ones where um, it, it still offers you a Medigap supplement like Medicfill. And it also offers you a Medicare Advantage. It's saying MA, not really to hide it, just because Medicare Advantage just takes up so many characters that you know, we'd end up with small fonts and unreadable. So MA means Medicare Advantage. So it says, we're going to give you both. The default, I'm not going to say the default, but your um, your lowest cost choice is going to be Medicare Advantage. Um, and if you want the medic fill, you have to pay up for that. Um, in the next to last bullet, you pay 15% instead of 5% for Medicare Advantage. Um, so you got to pay more to get the traditional Medicare supplement, something like medic fill. Um, or the other one, which is more dramatic, saves more money, um, is that uh, we... You know, provide Medicare Advantage at 5%. And how much you have to pay up to get the Medicfill, that Medicare supplement version, is either going to be 30% or 55% or 80% or 100% of the difference. So really, you're paying almost the full freight, especially if you don't retire for quite a while. Um, so it graduates. Depending on your age and when you retire, um, you would be paying, again, a 30% or higher level. Now, all this, I rushed through the columns here. We are not changing anything. We're not discussing changing anything for current retirees. Okay, now, before you cheer this on, let me jump to one piece. Let me jump right here and say, this is the court order that came from the Delaware courts in early October. And it said that during the stay, this court order stayed the implementation of Medicare Advantage. During the stay, and that stay is still in place, Defendants, the state, shall take all necessary and proper steps to ensure the healthcare insurance and benefits um, available to state retirees prior to October of last year, or in which they were enrolled prior to that time, remain in full force and effect. In other words, the court is saying we can't change things for current retirees. So, yes, everything we're looking at in the subcommittee um, is looking to make changes, no changes to current retirees, only for future retirees. But partly it's because we're ordered to do that by the court. So not the goodness of our hearts, and I mean state government broadly. The court told us we had to keep things alone. And not to mention, it's just plain a smart thing to do. And a fair thing to do is to not change the basic health benefits for current retirees. Now, apparently, 
last year the SEDC didn't think about that. But regardless, we're not we're not considering any of that, and uh, we ended up passing a motion to that effect this time. But these columns say um, for the funding is just we're starting that. These, if you change eligibility or you change the benefit and the costs, um, we need to figure out when does it apply. So model A, we call it, are those who've worked um, less than 10 years at this point. So they're hired after January 1st of 2015, you know, eight, eight and a half years ago. Um, so uh, that's one where it's, you know, it's 15, 20 years before it has any impact. Um, so that's the, the model A. Um, the model B is those new hires, people who aren't even hired yet, but are hired in 2025 and beyond. And that has the least impact because that has the longest time before anything happens. Um, this is retiree benefits. These are people who haven't started work yet. Um, so, you know, e even the, um, anyway, the, the, the smallest changes are here, uh, in column in model B and then model C, which is the one that's most commonly looked at. And it's the one with the biggest impact is it only applies to those who retire 2025 and beyond. Now, it has the biggest impact because it has the quickest Im uh, effect. It changes thing in less than two years. Um, it has a risk, which is we have a wave of retirements in December of 2024. We already are extremely short in state employees. So that Model C has good financial benefits to the state. It gets us hot closer to that funding level target we're looking for. Um, but it's at the cost of risking um, a broad exodus of state employees. So um, it's uh, it, it, it's an option that we've looked at, um, but it's an option that I think we have to be really careful um, before we select that option. But we still needed something to measure. So we looked at three different ways of um, applying it to future retirees. And those are the three columns there, A, B, and C. Okay, so that's the summary table. I thank, I thank our, our, the staff at the Department of uh, Human Resources in putting all this together in our consultants. Um, so the next piece was, uh, what if we co combine various things? Now, um, I don't wanna go into the details of it, but it's, you know, what if we take something from, um, from you know, from column one, something from column two, something from column three. So we're doing something in funding, we're doing something in eligibility, and then we're doing some plan design. Um, the details I feel don't matter right now, and I'll tell you why in a bit. Um, but I think what does matter is, you know, depending on the combination you choose, you may get 60% there, you may get 80% there. You know, it all depends on the combination you use. Uh, we, I think four different ones are presented here. These two just get you right around 70%. Um, and uh, so, you know, that's, uh, those are the ones that were presented. Um, that's all the new material that was presented in this, this format, but I wanna go over the rest of the presentation. Again, our next meeting is the 24th, which is Thursday a week from now, not this upcoming Thursday, the one after that. From 10 to 1, we extended the meetings from being two hours in length to three hours in length because we're trying to finish this work. Um, we want to get a draft report done together, have, you know, make sure there's additional pu public comment time. Again, it will be held at the Department of Insurance offices, not Department of Human Resources. And tentatively, uh, we'll have uh, one to three meetings in September. I've seen some uh, dates being floated around up and set yet. Um, and then they just uh, showed some stuff that we had seen before. It's a repeat, so I'm not going to go over that. Is there anything else here that's important? No, it's just all the other stuff that went into that summary. And that's where I think that, that summary, again, I asked for it. And I'm happy with it. I like one page, you can look at things and say, oh, yeah, that's why we don't like HRA. It either hurts people and saves money or it doesn't save money and it's okay. Um, so it doesn't really get us uh, there very far. Uh, we can see the last three bullets here are Medicare Advantage plans. If you don't like them, you can eliminate those three lines as far as what your preferences are. And then you'd be looking at the, the two middle lines, uh, maybe with a, a higher pension or share. Um, and then, you know, funding, figure out what, what level. And keep in mind, uh, nothing's free out there. You know? So if we were to do one of these, uh, if we, you know, we, we've already done, we passed a, a law in June. Again, the governor signed it. The legislature passed it. The governor signed it. Um, I was the uh, lead uh, sponsor in the House. Uh, Senate Bill 175, that that puts into Delaware code, it sort of makes permanent that 1% annual contribution to the OPEB fund. Um, that gets up to 60%. So, you know, we, we've made good progress. If we add, bring in the state funding to uh, a full 1%, we're going to get another close to 7.7%. We'd be somewhere around 67, 68%, um, uh, which is, you know, certainly getting towards 70, even 180 yet, yeah, but that does a good amount. Um, so let's let's go on other presentations that were available. Um, 
this is a document, again, all this stuff is online. It goes over, OPEB is the other, uh, geez, what is it? Um, other uh, post-employment benefits, other post-employment benefits, everything except your pension. So uh, in this case, uh, the OPEB fund is the health benefits that we've um, indicated to employees they would get when they retire. Uh, so it's an obligation. Uh, it's not a pension. Therefore, it's under it's tracked under the OPEB, and we have a trust fund for it, but it's woefully not on track uh, to cover the f- uh, future costs of it. Um, so this gives a little bit of, of the history. It talks about uh, some of the combinations. Uh, this There's nothing definitive in here. What does this show? So this shows uh, if we did uh, the following, uh, we you know do the 1% funding in the budget, we boost the payroll amount from 036 to 0.5%, additional half percent a year until it reaches 10%, or until it reaches the level it needs to get to. We also start charging 50% for a retiree to cover their spouse. Um, and we also boost from 5 to 15% uh, the amount of the premium that the, pe- the retiree has to pay. Um, uh, for those who are hired, uh, who are those who have at least uh, 20 years of service, so they would, oh, this is for only for new hires after uh, 2020, after 2024, starting one one 2025. So that this would get us to 80. percent Now this does require a lot of extra funding through the uh, that payroll going up. It actually I think it tops out around 8. percent That's a that's a big hit. Um, but anyway, it gets up to 80 percent, which is the target. And what this chart shows you is how um, the benefits that are paid out from the system and where does it come from? Well, you know, we end up having a little bit coming in from retirees, uh, the state paying a lot, and then the trust fund either we add to or take money out of. Um, So uh, it's one where we are currently adding to it a a bit, but partly that's because we pay so much by the state. Now, you look at this and may say, gosh, those retirees don't pay much now, do they? Um, and, and it may look that way, um, but it's very, uh, th- there's an awful lot more to it. Um, a retiree by their, by definition, it's, I'm sorry, for those who are covered uh, by Medicare, those 65 and older are covered by Medicare. So the state is only paying for that Medigap. Um, and that Medigap is only paying the last roughly 20% of healthcare costs in retirement uh, for somebody who's over 65, 65 or older. So um, the state is went from covering 100% for a 64-year-old to only 20% for a 65-year-old. Um, and uh, while the retiree is only paying so much into this plan, they've been paying into Medicare since the first day they worked. And furthermore, um, they are um, still paying Medicare um, <clears throat> as a recipient. You also pay monthly for Medicare. So they paid it every working month and they pay, pay it every retired month in addition to paying the state sum towards the Medigap program, that supplement that for that last 20%. So regardless, money comes in, if we were to do this and really be boosting regularly how much the state is paying into the system, um, then we are adding more and more to the trust fund and we're getting to the point where it is fully funded and the state share just drops like a stone, almost you know, to, to a third uh, by 2024. And just, you know, was that uh, 19 years, uh, less than 20 years? Um, by doing that big boost, that big half percent annual boost to the payroll amount that goes into the trust fund. Let me say one more thing about uh, this this OPEB. I don't think we have the chart on this. Um, that's not a half percent that comes out of your paycheck, but that is a half percent each year, an additional half percent that is set aside by the state of what it pays. So if it's paying somebody $100,000, sorry, my math is going to make this a lot easier if I do it that way then $500 a year for that employee is going to be set aside, not from their paycheck, but from the state. So this OPEB funding is not coming from your paycheck, from reti- from employees' paychecks. It's coming directly from the state in proportion to everyone's paycheck. Um, so if we were to increase it, it means the state needs to be setting aside this growing amount of dollars every year for the first 20 years until we get that uh, OPEB fund fully funded. Um, so. It's a chart. It's of interest, um, frankly, and this is the part that I'll get to my little soapbox. We've got a deadline next month of having any kind of input if we want to have it listened to um, by the SEC for the RFP. This stuff here has nothing to do with the RFP. Um, it really doesn't. It has to do with the OPEB fund. Well, you know, that's nice. We've got a deadline for the request for proposal uh, to bid out what kind of health um, plans you want to have uh, available to 
uh, put together an offer to our retirees. So um, anyway, I get a little frustrated when we're spending time on something that is not time critical. That's not time critical. We have a very time critical thing. So let's look at this next slide. Now, this slide is impossible to read, which is why it's available on the website and you can look at it and you can expand it and get it so you can read it. Um, so what you have here uh, is really, I'll say, uh, three columns. You've got the blue columns are the current plan known as special medic fill. It is very, very similar to a Medigap plan F or G. Not identical, but really, really, really close. Okay, and truly, really, really close. Um, so it covers um, it, it covers most things. You know, there's very few co-payments. You can see all these zeros here, right? Uh, member pay is zero, 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 zero. There's, you know, what, what's your deductible? Not applicable. You know, it, so all these things are here um, with a very little out-of-pocket cost for the retiree. So you can say it's it's a very comprehensive Medigap, Medicare Supplement Plan, and as is Medigap F, Medigap G. These are very comprehensive Medicare Supplement Plans, and you know, so there is a 20% uh, cost, and that's for private duty nursing. Um, so at home, you know, nursing care, or maybe you have, I, I don't, I'm no expert on this stuff. So anyway, that tells you this blue is what the current plan is. Now, what we, the subcommittee asked for is you, 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 sorry, the administration, you know, the SCBC, the division of uh, the department of, of uh, human resources always says, well, it's medic fill or Medicare advantage. I'm like, well, that's a, it's a big range. Is there anything in the middle? And of course the answer is yes. There definitely is something in the middle. Medicare Advantage, arguably the, the healthcare aspects of Medicare Advantage as was prepared to be delivered to state retirees as of January 1st of this year, cost the state nothing. It is bid out as you don't have to pay anything. Now, it's not because someone wants to lose a lot of money. Medicare Advantage is this funky plan where um, the, the money that Medicare uses to pay the first 80% of those costs, and it got that because of the lifetime payroll deductions from the employer and the employee and the monthly contributions from the retiree, um, that 80%, they don't keep. They don't pay it out to the providers. They pay all that to the insurance company who has signed you up as a Medicare Advantage client customer. And then... They spend it as they see fit, and they think that they can cover 100% of your needs using that 80% that Medicare uses. It's an argument of Medicare is so inefficient. It's not, by the way. Um, so they take that money for the 80% for the Medicare system, and whether you're healthier or sick, whether your costs are high or low, um, they're responsible for delivering that to you. How do they do that? Well, the two main differences is that they use a, 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 a limited network. Not everyone who um, provides health care accepts Medicare. Uh, for instance, the one that was proposed, the Highmark Diamond Delaware Special Medicare Advantage Plan. Um, not everyone's in that network. And the second thing is they use prior authorization for a lot of procedures. I think I've heard somewhere around 2000. Um, so by limiting who they work with, they can negotiate rates down so they don't have to pay as much. And by doing prior authorizations, they can, um, they would say, um, help avoid unnecessary procedures. And others would say they can delay and delay and delay um, when they approve different procedures. And sometimes you may give up at that point. They can save some money that way, um, opponents will point out. Um, and their denial rate is somewhere less than 10%, but somewhere like that 8 or 9% level, Most some of the Medicare Advantage providers. So anyway, that's, um, that's the Medicare Advantage. That's pretty extreme from a really generous Medicare system. So what we said is, well, what's the stuff in the middle so that we can consider offering something less to future retirees that is not as um, unwelcome as Medicare Advantage? So that's what these other two columns are, N and L. Um, and uh, uh, da, 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 frankly, I think the, geez, which one? One's high, one's low. We'll get to that in a minute. Let's go to the next chart. So here, what you want to look at is, let's let's start here in this 50th percentile. So the current medic, medic fill system, <coughs> the, um, 
uh, yeah, actually, let's go to the 90th percentile. Um, so here, this is this is uh, what the health costs are for somebody who has higher health costs than 90% of state retirees. So it's the person who has the most expensive procedures needed, treatments needed, uh, maybe, you know, is, it has a lot of, uh, of health issues. Um, so they, they use a lot of health care. So um, between the premiums, and this is assuming that, you know, there's certain costs to get this program or that program, um, under the current Medicfill system, this person would pay around $800 a year. Um, under the N system, they pay around $2,200, and under the L system, about $2,800. Um, so clearly, the Medicfill, as I've described, the most generous one, is the lowest cost to, to the retiree. And this is why a retiree said, don't you, darn, don't you dare change it, especially something dramatically different like Medicare Advantage, um, when we have a great system. So that's what this, you know, you can see for the, the retiree with the biggest health issues, Medicfill is a great system cost-wise. Um, may not be great for the state, but it's pretty darn good uh, for the retiree. And these other ones are not as good. And the worst one uh, is the L. Uh, if we come to the middle, uh, you actually um, you know, are, are going to pay less for the L than the N. Um, and part of that's because the premium's less. So the, the L is the low, that's right, L is the low level. And N is the median, medium level between the three. So Medicfill is the most generous, L is the least, and N is in the middle. Um, so the average person will still pay, uh, the average person's 50th percentile. They've got costs that are right in the middle. You know, half, half, people, half the retirees have costs greater, half, half lower. So um, the average retiree under Medicfill pays somewhere around $670 a year out of pocket uh, and for their share of the premium. Um, and then for the low level, they would go up to $1,462. And for the medium one, about $1,950. Um, and then for those who are very healthy, um, Medicfill is still, you notice know, the trend here, is the least expensive for the retiree. Um, and then um, L, the, the lower version, which is in between these two, um, sorry, the lower version is uh, what new employees would retire at. It, it's, it's not, you know, it's twice as much, but not that bad. And the Medium one is um, you know, three times as much as Medicville, um, more than that. So we got to see this and say, okay, well, you know, this is something where we can look at it and say, maybe for future retirees, we would offer L, but give you the ability to buy up to the level N, which you can see if you have a lot of health issues can really save you some money. Um, and maybe even let you buy up to Medicville. No, but we haven't modeled that yet. Um, so anyway, these we wanted to make sure... That that we didn't have only the two extremes, Medicfill, Medicare Advantage, nothing else matters. No, nothing else is available. That's not the case. It's a lot that's in the middle. And so we so we um, we're, wanted to see these examples. We may indeed say to the State Employee Benefit Committee that in your October 1st request for proposal, please get quotes for Medicare L, Medigap L, and Medigap N. So we know what the costs are, and then we can we can use that to figure out is this what we want for future retirees? Current retirees, those who are retired by the end of 2024, currently retired, and those who retire the next, you know, what's that, eight, uh, 15 months or so, um, you're going to get Medicfill, and you're going to pay either 0 or 5% of the premium, and that's it. No change, no change, no change, no change for current retirees. But for future retirees, maybe those who retire after 2025, maybe those who are hired after 20, you know, 2025 and beyond, maybe those who have been working less than 10 years so far, um, would get into maybe a Medigap L, the ability to pay up to get into N, maybe to pay up to, to get into uh, Medicville or a Medigap F or G style system. Okay, so uh, that's not what I want to show right now, but I will get there in a second. Um, so this is that, this is uh, the conclusion of that court case. And what it says is uh, you got to stop uh, enrollment into Medicare Advantage, into the current Medicare Advantage uh, plan. It says uh, you, you, you can't uh, you, you can't make this change. Uh, the you, you'll take the state will take every effort to make sure that what's available today continues to be available for all state retirees prior to October third. So that what was available to them um, continues to be available to them. <coughs> and um, did I miss the? This third one, wait, 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 enrollment. 
Uh, this is, okay, so the, fir the first paragraph just says that um, that the plaintiffs those who took the state to court um, won that their request to halt Medicare Advantage was granted, and details were uh, you can't move forward with Medicare Advantage, and you have to keep making available what is currently available. Now, I point that out because this top paragraph says yeah can't implement Medicare Advantage. I'm not really sure why the heck we're talking about Medicare Advantage in light of the upcoming request for proposal. We have a court order that says we can't. So why are we spending time on it? <sighs> I don't know. Um, and then the second one says, you know, we have to keep the current system available for current retirees. That's what we voted on on Thursday. I don't think we should be taking a victory lap here. The court ordered us to do this. We did this. Cost for celebration? I, I don't really know. Um, so let me jump out to that, to that. Okay, so you can't see this either, can you? So the first motion we had on Thursday was uh, the subcommittee recommends that one, current Medicare eligible and pre-Medicare state retirees, those are already retired, and state employees who retire prior to January 1st, 2025, shall be entitled to special medic fill prescription benefits or a substantially equivalent Medicare supplement with a prescription plan with no changes to the state share percentage of payments. In other words, current retirees and those who retire in the next year and three months, year and four months, must keep the same kind of system we have right now, a Medigap F4G, the current version is called medic fill. Um, and that passed. We still had some cabinet secretaries who work for the governor uh, go no, not voting on it, but this passed the subcommittee. Again, I don't think we should be congratulated for that, but I don't think we need to be shamed for it. We, I think overall the subcommittee did the right thing. Um, so that's the first motion. And then the second motion um, was, uh, I move that the subcommittee exclude Medicare Advantage as an option to reduce the OPEB liability. Um, there was a good amount of discussion and then a motion to table that uh, this motion. Uh, so it is uh, stalled at this point. And the reason given for that motion was it didn't seem like we had a uh, consensus to move forward with it. We I'll say we weren't getting the warm and fuzzies from enough members of the subcommittee that we thought we had the votes for that. So um, the, uh, the uh, individuals on the subcommittee agreed to table uh, this motion for now. We can bring it up the next meeting on the 24th or other motions. Um, so let me go to this piece here. Um, I do want to point out, um, it's sort of like titles. Um, so Delaware's not alone. Um, there are a lot of jurisdictions that are responsible for uh, the health benefits of their retirees. And because of accounting rules over the past 10 or 20 years, the gap between the cost of the promises and money set aside for it is pretty dramatic. And it's now being publicly listed and frankly it's embarrassing and folks who lend money to these government agencies like bond investors uh don't like seeing this big uh liability unfunded liability so these jurisdictions have been looking at how to save money and medicare advantage is one system because as i said you can sometimes get your employees your retirees covered with medicare advantage without paying money um, so you can say, yeah, big obligation here. I can do it. And I don't even have to pay a penny. Um, so guess what? A lot of people are doing that. New York City plan to do that. Um, Newcastle County already has done that. So they moved their retirees uh, to Medicare Advantage. Um, New York City <coughs> followed a very similar path to Delaware. When Delaware went through this, Delaware had been studying it for a while voted on it in late 21, um, uh, did an RFP, voted on the contract in early 22, told the retirees in early June of 2022, lawsuit happened by September, court order by October. Um, and actually a similar path was done with this city of New, uh, of New York, New York City, which has like a quarter million people. We have 30,000 retirees, they have 250,000. So they've been going through um, a litigation and uh, what uh, happened last week uh, was that the court said, uh, no, no, you, New York City government, you cannot make a change from a traditional Medigap system to Medicare Advantage and say, oh, it's, it's essentially the same. 
Um, so they stopped it. And the reason I raise this is that the arguments made by um, those who are taking New York City to court for this issue are very close to the arguments made by Delaware's retirees uh, in their court case, which is still outstanding. So it just went out, you know, some, some stuff happened there. Um, okay. Is that, that is everything I wanted to point out there. And I can just get that off the screen. So with that, we're going to just make it up here. Um, I see I only have one person on and it's fine. Thank you. Um, but, uh, if there's any questions, post them now. I want to point out again, our next meeting of the retiree health benefits, uh, advisory subcommittee is on Thursday, the 24th. Um, and, uh, it's from 10 AM to 1 PM. Um, and it'll be at the, uh, department of insurance Dover office. So with that, uh, Debbie, uh, Debbie, you are most welcome. Uh, thank you for thanking me. Um, it's, it's, indeed, it's, it's my job. Um, it is something that I think I'm, uh, uh, well positioned to, uh, help uh, the subcommittee dig deep into this, ask the right questions and hopefully come out with, uh, good, uh, decisions. Um, I will say that again, my focus right now for our next meeting is get everything done. We need to do to get a report finalized to the state employee benefit committee for their request for proposal. And it's not just, it is, it does include what plans do you want? Is it a Medigap FG kind of thing like we have right now? Medifil? Is it also is it only is it also a Medicare Medigap L, maybe a Medigap N? Uh, in some combinations, we make it available. We don't need to decide whether the employee pays 5%, 10%, 15%, whatever. We don't need to do that for the RFP. Okay. We don't need to do the combos and say, is this going to bring our funding level up to 67.8 or 72.3 or 85.7. We don't need any of that for the RFP. We need to know what we're asking the insurance companies to propose to say, we can offer these three plans, a FG type and L type and N type uh, for your population. Um, and we would charge you so much per year for every one who takes N so much for L so much for FG. Um, that's what we need. Okay. So we need to know what plans we want in the RFP. We do not need to talk about Medicare Advantage. <clears throat> well, frankly, no. do we officially need to say no to Medicare Advantage for this RFP? Yes, I think we can. I think, frankly, we should have done it on Thursday. Uh, we ran, ran out of time. Um, but we need to be clear to the SCBC that our recommendation is you do not ask for a Medicare Advantage plan to be proposed because a judge ordered us not to. I mean, how, how much clearer does it need to be? So... Yes, SCBC, no Medicare Advantage, don't ask for that. Do ask for something like FG, like you have right now with Medicville, and probably ask for L and N. And between now and when we get the proposals and we sign any contracts and we make any plans available for retirees, we figure out how we're going to use them. Are we going to make sure that that FG, like Medicville, is available to all current retirees and anyone who retires uh, by the end of 2024 at that normal zero or 5% cost. Okay, that's all known, easy. For those who retire 2025 and beyond, if that's when we're grandfathering it, well, we need to figure out which of those three grandfathering methods to use. Uh, retired starting 2025, hired starting 2025, hired um, after 2015 or later. We need to decide that before June 1st when we're enrolling people, when we share the, the change when you're grandfathering, you're making a change between current retirees and future retirees, and you define what that border is. So you need to decide the date. We don't need to do this for the RFP. We need to do this before the RFP comes back. We've got time for that. So let's focus on what we don't, what we've got very limited time getting the input for the RFP. And that's what plans we want bid. And frankly, what plans do we not want bid? I don't think we want the HRA. I don't think the subcommittee wants the HRA. Let's officially say off. Our recommendation off the table for the upcoming RFP. I don't think we want Medicare Advantage. I know we don't want it for current retirees. We've passed a motion for that easily. I think we don't want it for future retirees, but that's going to be a vote on the 24th. Let's get that vote done. 
and let's be clear in our recommendations to the state employee benefit committee. If that's the case, if it passes, no HRA, no Medicare Advantage. Yes, Medigap FG. Yes, Medigap L. Yes, Medigap N. If that's what the subcommittee of that combination is what we feel is the, the best uh, to offer and to start offering as a default for future retirees. Um, so that's the input we need now. Let's stop all this noise going everywhere. Um, and frankly, it just serves to confuse, to go into dive into rabbit holes here and there. What's this combination do? It doesn't matter. It does not matter for the RFP next that we're, we need to finish our input now. So focus on the RFP, get that done in the first hour of the meeting. Cool. Then we can start looking at other stuff. We can go down rabbit holes all we care to at that point. Darn it. Let's finish our input for the RFP at the meeting on the 24th. That's what I'm looking for. Um, and I hope, hope we get there. Um, retirement and, and all of this is scary. Kelly, um, it, it, I, I, I get an awful lot of emails on this topic. And, and one I had from a friend, uh, just lives maybe two miles away. And she said, haven't been paying attention, but darn it, retirement is coming up. I, I, I need to start paying attention. And, and, she, and she caught, you know, about my recording of this on YouTube and, and thank you for it. Um, indeed, this isn't just for retirees. And this is something that was, I'm going to say misunderstood but also something that evolved. Um, when, when the public meetings began in August and September, and there was a large outcry, when the administrations, you know, the cabinet secretaries were there taking questions and had people from Highmark and people say, oh, I just want my medic fill. Just let me, you know, okay, I know you want to offer Medicare Advantage. Just let me pay the difference and let me get my medic fill. And that was said by many people in the audience. Uh, many, I, I don't know many, more than two, okay? Um, Fast forward a year plus, and now the administration is saying, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we now get that you don't want Medicare Advantage only. And they took them a year to figure this out. Um, so we're going to give you the ability to pay up and pay into Medicville. Well, you know what? A heck of a lot's gone on in the past 12 months. And it feels like many members of the administration have missed this. We've gotten a lot more information about how different Medicare Advantage is from Medigap programs like Medicville. Um, and with that more information, you know what? I've changed what I think is a good outcome and only permitting current retirees to pay up into Medicare Advantage or for that matter, forcing future retirees, if they don't want Medicare Advantage with its weaknesses, and but they do want a good Medigap program like an FG and force them to pay the full cost difference Maybe in September I would have been open to that. With all that I've learned since then, no, I'm not. I'm not open to that. I think that that is bad for our retirees. That's bad for our state reputation. I think it's been bad for hiring and retaining employees. I think it's bad. Um, but I'm one member of a subcommittee. We need to, you know, hear from everyone. We need to see where majority of the votes are, and then we need to finish our ad advice, our recommendation to the SCBC for their use in finalizing the RFP. Um, and so the things I want it, for the RFP is to know what plans we ask for. So I, I want our recommendation to be which plans do we want requested be bid by the insurance companies. The RFP also should have very detailed uh, description of how decisions are made. Okay, we get three bids on the FG Medigap, we get two bids for the L and a different three bids for the N. How do we choose which one or ones? Are we looking for a single provider for all three plans if we do that? Or is it okay to mix between them? Um, importantly, if we only ask for Medicare F, L, and N and someone happens to bid Medicare Advantage, I'd like to have the RFP be, be really clear that we won't consider it. So I think those the rules, the details really matter. Um, and so I'd like to have recommendations there regarding um, how, it, it, obviously it's not just price, we also want reputation, we want to see, um, you know, the proof that the data on why a different provider uh, is worthy of consideration, you know, how are they viewed, how are their, you know, customer service um, ratings, uh, you know, things like that. Um, so, you know, what are the what are the factors that are looked at in making that decision? And again, if we're limiting it to certain plans, 
make sure that we're not going to accept stuff outside of what we asked for. Um, I have a lot of wounds uh, from the pushback from retirees over the past year, and I don't want them again. So I think it's really important that the RFP be crafted in a way that we are not going to make the same mistake that we did last year. Um, so I want to be clear on what plans the RFP uh, requests, and they're ones that the um, subcommittee advises. I want to make sure that the metrics of how this, the decisions are made on which plans are put together and offered to retirees. And the other thing is, I want the advisory subcommittee to be kept in the loop. I want to see a draft of the RFP. I want to see the final RFP. I want to see when the bids come in, how uh, they're rated. Frankly, I'd like it would be nice to have the subgroup that reviews the bids and makes their decisions. Now, these bids are often have company secrets for pricing and stuff. It's not like you can put the bids out, out there without awful lot of redacting. But that process and to say, you know, here are here's our rating sheet. We told you we had 10 criteria. We told you what the weight is of each of these 10 criteria. They may be equal. Some may be a, a bigger impact. Others a smaller impact. We should be able to see the, the sheet said, you know, bids one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, and here's, and these ones were for FG, this is for L, this is for N. Um, here's each of their scores. Here's their total score. Guess what? We have a winner. Guess what? We have a winner. Guess what? We have a winner. Make sure it's followed with fidelity. Make sure it's followed properly. We should have public transparency on that. Um, so there's some things which I'd like to see in that RFP. And frankly, these issues, to me, should be the first and only thing the subcommittee works on at this next meeting before it starts going down all the stupid rabbit holes. Okay. Um, combinations. I don't give a hoot about combinations until we finish our recommendations for the, uh, for the, uh, SBC for their RFP. Okay. Sorry. I ranted and raged and I appreciate your patience. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, we'll see. I, I note that the past two meetings we've had, wonderful, wonderful number of uh, members of the public coming out and uh, being there watching, listening, and also speaking up. Uh, we've had a lot of good public comment. And the more bodies and eyes from the public that are there staring at this process, I think the better. Um, I think that we have uh, much, we're much more transparent, we're much more answerable to the public because of the public's presence. And so I know that trust me, I live in Newark. I understand driving to Dover is not an easy thing. Um, and, but I, I appreciate those who are able to take the time and come down this past Thursday, the previous meeting, the next meeting. Um, I, I, you're really making a difference. And uh, thank you if you're able to do that. Uh, those who reach out by email to members of the subcommittee, thank you. Um, that This is our job. Uh, we accepted this appointment uh, to the subcommittee in order to follow this process, knowing it's a public process and knowing that we would be hearing from the public um, and that our meetings would be in the public. And that is our mission. So thank you for uh, helping us be successful in our mission. Uh, I think it's, we've heard a lot the last meeting, I think from really from members of the public that they're not sure they've ever seen a public body operate this transparently uh, this well as far as living up to uh, its uh, its requirement of being a public body uh, we have been uh, really going out of our way to uh, encourage receive and honor uh, public comment and I think it's really making a difference in uh, decisions that are made by this body and I think we there's a lot of public bodies that are not <laughs> that open uh, to the public so um, again, thank you for everyone who's putting time into this. This is, as you know, incredibly important for your future. Uh, so it's a good use of your time, I would argue. And thank you for helping us uh, do our job better. Um, with that, I likely won't do another meeting next, uh, one of these next weekend, but the weekend after, which will be after the meeting on the 24th, um, I'll try to give an update that weekend sometime. Again, thank you for tuning in. I also post this on YouTube for in case you know anyone who uh, doesn't use Facebook, uh, another avenue to get into that. I will post 
that link through Facebook so you can help your friends find it if they'd like. Um, and with that, I want to thank you for joining me. Uh, have a good rest of your weekend, a good upcoming week. And for some of you, I look forward to seeing you on the 24th down in Dover at the uh, Department of Insurance offices. Take care.